Massive thank you as always to our top tier patron, Sarah Turner. It's Not Just In Your Head is hosted by psychotherapist Dr. Harriet Frad, substance use disorder counsellor Ekoi Hero, and myself, the editor and producer Liam Tate. This podcast is entirely funded by listeners, and as the famous meme states, we are critiquing capitalism because we are forced to participate in it in order to survive. So, if you can afford to give, then your contribution will ensure that we can keep making the show. However, if you can't, then please just leave a review on your podcast platform of choice, tell your friends about us, and follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Reddit, or YouTube. In the mental health field, too often, we've made it seem as if it's just in your head. Just in your head. If the landlord can hijack the rent by 20%. That impacts people's mental health. We can have a profit-driven mental health care system if we want our people to be connected and healthy. My name is Francesca Mezzanzana. I'm an anthropologist working in Latin America. I've been working with Runa indigenous communities since 2011, and I've been researching on different issues from gender to learning, childhood, and most recently, human-non-human relationships, and now based the Rachel Carson Center for Environment and Society at the University of Munich in Germany. Nice. Yeah, came across this article, Amazonian Child Care. And yeah, it's fascinating. It raises a whole bunch of interesting questions. I wondered maybe as a sort of place to begin, there's this term, weird, weird countries. I wondered if you could define what that is, maybe set the scene for what weird countries' expectations are of what makes a good parent. It's a term that has been coined in psychology to identify specific societies post-industrial societies, Western societies, and weird stands for Western, educated, industrialized, rich societies. So it's a broad term that includes most societies in Europe, the US, Australia. But the term is broad enough to include also elites in the global south. I think the, fir the first person to coin the term was Joe Heyrich, who's a cross-cultural psychologist. And this style of, I guess, parenting, which is obviously maybe perhaps unquestioned, but maybe it's not unquestioned, is the expectations are, yeah, the expectations are what? Because you do outline them, just a sort of constant sense of maybe diligence or a constant sense of vigilance to someone else's needs, to your child's needs and the urgency of providing this immediately. So I think weird parenting can mean many things. So there is, as I mentioned in the article, there is natural parenting, intensive parenting, attachment parenting, but I think they all converge on similar points. So for instance, Weird parenting is usually child-centered, emotionally absorbing, labor-intensive, often mother-centered, and also financially expensive. Because usually, if both parents work, they can't care for their children in an optimal way. So one has to stay home. Usually it's the mother. Within this kind of like understanding of intensive parenting, the mother is the one who undertakes most of the work. I got that point, but I also understand that parenting yeah. for the 20% at most in the United States of the more privileged and economically settled people does set up their children for the kind of self-absorption and self-promotion that they need in a savagely competitive capitalist society. It's yeah, not, it's, it's that not. question of uh, what is parenting for? for? What is the sort of ideal child or human or citizen or consumer? And I think that it's interesting, like you mentioned that a couple of documents from the World Health Organization that have codified, I yeah. guess, this particular way of parenting. And you do talk um, towards the end of the article about the danger of it, dangers of exporting this kind of what appears to be just this is hard science, this is how you bring up kids, but it's completely 
a way of bringing up children in a certain culture, right? In a certain society that has certain values. And like Harriet's saying, for better or worse, and I think really probably we're all saying worse, <laughs> yeah. you, can bring up, you can bring up kids to be the perfect neoliberal subjects, right? Yes. Right. But you're talking to not the majority of people in our weird country, but the 20% who are privileged, or at least about that, 44.7% of Americans are desperate. They don't live paycheck to paycheck. They live crisis to crisis. And their parents couldn't possibly devote that kind of attention or afford that kind of nanny or daycare. Yes, absolutely. This is part of the work, the research work I'm doing also at the moment. So what I'm, when I mention in the article the kind of early childhood development interventions, I'm referring to something that it's called the Nurturing Care Framework, which mm -hmm. was established in 2018 by the World Health Organization together with the UNICEF and the World Bank Group. And it's basically, it's an intervention program that presupposes that for children in the global south are their brain, that it presupposes that their brains are underdeveloped. They say it quite clearly, quite explicitly, they use the term brain and that we need to intervene at the level of parenting in order to solve their issues. There is, it's so problematic that I don't even know where to start. It's problematic because there is no scientific evidence that these children are cognitively impaired. There's absolutely not right. evidence for that. There is also the problem of what they define as optimal child care, as, as you mentioned before, refers specifically to this upper middle class American child care, which is then applied in the global south as a universal science-based type of optimal care. Yes, it's problematic for all sorts of reasons. I think that the kind of intensive care that I describe in the article and that also underpins the nurturing care framework is really one that emphasizes in the individual needs of the child. There is this beautiful expression by an anthropologist, a colleague, Edric Cassero, who has worked in New York with children from different socioeconomic backgrounds. And she's noticed that upper middle class people cultivated a kind of soft individualism in their children, which meant that their children were seen as fragile, in need of self-cultivation. And all of this was characterized by an extreme individualism. And that's what is being exported under the guise of science-based optimal care. Yes, I think it says more about the U.S. domination of the U.N. and the culture of capitalism dominating some of the culture of the U.N. than anything else. because. In the U.S., most people can't even afford that kind of care. We don't even have maternity leaves, unlike most of the rest of the world, if not all the rest of the world, except for five countries. So it's this pretense that America is privileged people, which we're not. It's a mass of poor people struggling. It places an enormous amount of responsibility on the shoulders of like single individual parents which then feel they are somehow failing their children for not being at home, giving them attention, engaging them in meaningful play. So another kind of stronghold of this ESD framework is that parents should engage in play with appropriate toys. And of course, if you measure how good parenting is based on parental involvement, like playful involvement with their children and on the appropriateness of toys, then you exclude a great, the majority of the world population, because mm -hmm. that's not how children are raised, you know, outside the middle class in the US, in fact, I would say right. in the US, because I think I'm from Italy and parents behave differently. They, they, they don't constantly engage 
in child-centered play at all. And your article nicely illustrates the kind of different styles of oh. what you think child rearing is for or what it should be like. I wondered if maybe you wanted to outline maybe some of what that experience was because your partner's from Ecuador. Yeah, basically, I think as an academic, I think I've been influenced a lot because I'm working in a very middle-class environment by these intensive parenting theories. They're quite predominant in all among academics. Mm. And I, when I first had my son, I kind of, I had that experience of feeling that I should be doing, I should be attending to him constantly and just, yeah, breastfeeding him, but also like spending quality time with him as an infant, whatever that meant. When then we went to the Ecuadorian Amazon, where my husband is from, to see his family and to introduce our son to our family there who live in an indigenous community in the region of Pastaza. They basically thought I was acting very weirdly with him because I believed that it was important for him to be with me the whole time and that I gave him lots of attention, that I responded very promptly to any of his request, whereas they thought that, first of all, that my son was not really mine, but that belonged to many other people, including children. So I don't touch on this very much in the article, but my son was often held and taken around by children of different ages, but also quite young children, like seven years old. Secondly, they thought that all this attention that I was giving my son was har harmful for him in the sense that he should just learn to be with other people and attend to other people and not be at the center of attention, but rather that he should learn, even as an infant, to be with people. So to observe what's going on around him without someone always being focused on him. And secondly, they also thought it wasn't good for me either to be always focused on a son because that meant that I didn't see other things happening. I wasn't engaging in relationships with anyone except for him. And that was definitely not good for also my own mental health. And people are very humble. So they never told me anything too explicitly. But then little by little, they just started taking him away from me. So for walks and for an hour, two hours, half a day, the entire day. So that eventually, yeah, I realized that, I mean, I started thinking about what I was doing and why people, they were reacting the way they did. I also think I relaxed a bit because I was far away from an environment that told me that I should be a specific kind of mother and parent. And mm -hmm. I just trusted that other people knew what to do. Other people who had many children and that, yes, they could take care of my son and that I should be open to the possibility that my way was not the way. Yeah. And so to, to what end, I guess, and I think you paint it quite well in the article that this is about raising uh, people to be socially focused, right? That they are from a very early age engaged in community and community activities, that they're not like in just a particular sort of child zone, that they are overhearing adult conversations and that the whole focus seems to me, if I've got it right, that it's about raising people to be aware of other people and that there's a sort of demanding of needs that everyone has. Is that correct? Was that a sort of yep. correct assumption? Yes, this is absolutely correct. I would say that the most, the thing that matters the most to Aruna people and not only like in general, indigenous Amazonian people is to nurture children who will be responsible for others, who will be aware of other people's needs, 
and who will act on those needs. So we'll help out others. This is fascinating because there's been many conversations that have happened with guests on this podcast. And one of the things that's often talked about is this idea of unmet needs. And I find it fascinating because we had Gabor Mate's son was the co-author of his latest book, The Myth of Normal. And mm-hmm. it's a deep dive into all of that, really, unmet needs and trauma and a sort of very holistic view of everything. But I find it fascinating that from even maybe a sort of Gabor Mate perspective, would, you know, would he consider the, this way of raising kids to be just like trauma on a huge scale, right? Like all these kids' needs are not being met. You know, that they're being taught something that is true, no doubt, of the Runa community. And it also used to be true of many of the Native American communities in the United States, which is that their needs will be met by the community. In the mm. U.S., yeah. there's no way the community is going to meet your needs. And you may want to join the fight to increase that, but you sure don't have it. And children are isolated in nuclear families. And if your nuclear family doesn't meet your needs, that's traumatic and terrible. But of course, 80% about it of American families can't meet their kids' need because they're having to work and worry about money all the time. I think it's great preparation for a community-oriented world, but it I don't know how it would work in the kind of neoliberal, competitive, savage environment of socially starved people that Americans have. Americans are very lonely and individualistic and incapable of trusting. And that's not only Americans, 81% of women in the United States, not 81, I'm sorry, over half of American women are single by choice so that even that to that coupled existence, whether it's hetero or LGBTQIA couplings have collapsed, that there is a collapse of community. It's beginning to be reactivated through unions. By next month, there'll be 3,000 strikes across the United States. I just read that this morning. And some of them are huge, like the UPS workers, 340,000 people on strike. And so that is a kind of recognition that individually you can't do it because you're up against a powerful force for which you need a union, a united group. But it is a new development in the United States, and it's not the usual sensibility in the U.S., which is the opposite of community. It's Everyone competing against everyone else for scarce resources and being screwed and exploited. Yeah. So is it, yeah, is it really the full sentence should be unmet social needs? Because it may be the, yeah, the perspective on this would be that the Rona people are in their child rearing, essentially are meeting all these children's needs, their social needs. They're connected to a community of people. Would that be a sort of, would that be a sort of accurate way of framing it, do you think? I would say that, for instance, like these children are children whose needs are met. So, you know, these are children who are fed. These are children who are loved. These are children who play a lot. Mm. It's just that the kind of play they, they do is simply not the one we would recognize as play. Mm-hmm. So, for instance, the children are very, participate from very early on into household work. And this is, I know this is a taboo team, children working, but to Daruna and to children themselves, like this kind of household work is key to learning so many skills that are just so fundamental for everyday life. So the first thing is, I think Daruna children's needs are met. Mm-hmm. And secondly, they are met in many different ways. For instance, Someone who arrives to the Runa community, you might think, okay, parents don't talk constantly with their, with their children all the time. Mothers in, I don't know, I believe in the UK, like mothers in the UK do, like mothers in Germany do. But children are talking so much with peers from like very early age. They spend so long with peers. 
So they are not, they're not missing out on anything. They're just learning things from other people outside the nuclear family. And so I think that the question of unmet needs, I think we need to think about what we mean with, as, aside from basic needs, what we really mean with needs. I mean, is, does a child need to be the center of attention the whole time? Does a child need to be talked to by his parents the whole time so that he then develops a very good vocabulary and then can go to a, then he excels at school and then he can become then a, a successful manager. I think that when we think about needs, we really need to think about what yeah, first of all, what we mean by it, and then what is the purpose of that particular practice and why it's framed as need, as a need, so to mm. speak. Because it is really oh. interesting reading that article, and there's several things in there. Teasing causes thought, which was a really interesting it, thing, but reading it as a sort of fragile Westerner, it was yeah. like the whole sort of teasing the kid with the breast was interesting. I don't know if you wanted to paint the picture. When I was breastfeeding my son, I was following the advice that was given by the midwives in Italy. And the midwives were part of the La Leche League. And I was told that I should be breastfeed in a very quiet place, away from other people, that my child should decide when to interrupt the breastfeeding or not. And that I had to look at my child's eyes all the time to create bonding. and. When I was in the village, a neighbor of us, she just sat next to me as I was breastfeeding my baby. And she just basically put her hand onto my breast and took away the nipple from, from my baby's mouth. And he was visibly upset, but she laughed in a very gentle way. And she was teasing him, telling him, little baby, do you know that this breast is not yours? It was done in a very tender way. It was gentle teasing. Mm. And my son just didn't know how to react. And then he moved, he showed some signs of annoyance. And then she kept insisting and then she just let it go. And he breastfed again. And when I asked, what was, I asked, I think I asked my husband what, what, why he thought that this neighbor would do such a thing. Why would she interrupt breastfeeding? What was the value of doing that? That he told me that she just wanted to let the baby know that the breast is, is in fact not his breast. And that as a mother, as a woman, I also, I also have ownership of my body. I have a will. So maybe I don't want to breastfeed him for hours. And it was like a, a kind of introduction of my son to a world in which his will is not the only one. And I think it was very powerful for me because it's simply something that it would never happen in, in, in Germany where I live now or in Italy, my home country. Yeah. Yeah. There's a few lines from the article, like children are very rarely the center of adults' lives. Nothing is adjusted to suit a child's needs. <laughs> they do not praise their children's efforts, nor are they concerned with the expression of their most intimate needs. It's eye-opening reading it. Sounds harsh to someone brought up in Western culture, which focuses on privileged people as we do. Because yes. our culture is defined by the upper parts of the wealthier people in your culture. Yeah, but it's all for the service of Again, it sounds harsh, but in practice, it sounds like it's to create people that are socially minded, that well, they're thinking about other people. It's very interesting that in the United States, with our spate of at least one, but usually two mass murders a week performed by men, they've all been recently abandoned by a job, but more frequently by a romantic interest, because I think they were grown up to feel like whoever else hurts them in their lives, they should have a woman understanding and with them at all times, like their mothers were supposed to be. Right. And when 
doesn't happen, they're very angry, angry enough to shoot random people. I would be interested in the level of crime in the Rona community. It's very low because everyone knows each other. It's a very safe environment in terms of, yeah, at the community level. When you go to cities where some indigenous Rona migrate, then obviously it's a completely different context. But in rural communities, it's a pretty safe environment. Yeah. No, right. In and the United States, kids are taught they're not allowed to go outside and play unless they live in a wealthier neighborhood. I saw the difference when my parents moved from New York City from a neighborhood that was starting to get dangerous because of overcrowding and of people in apartments and so on. And kids who were basically abandoned without a community to the suburbs where you could play outside. But people are warned constantly about other people. Don't talk to the strangers. Don't do this. Don't do that. And kids whose parents work, which is most kids in the United States, have to stay in their apartments because the outside world is so dangerous. It's a different world which they're being prepared. Yeah. And there's pros and right, yeah, pros and cons to each, right? Because I remember a few weeks ago in in something we were recording, Harriet, you had I think we were talking about the loneliness stuff, but how in a ruthless system, kindness makes you a sucker. Whereas kindness is required for good social relationships. So it's a really tricky thing because you would actually say that being vigilant and being aware of sort of ruthless competition is a useful sort of survival uh, thing to teach if that's your environment you're growing up in. So obviously I was probably brought up more in line that I am special and probably was brought up under this particular weird style of parenting. But I wondered how other people maybe have reacted to your work and to this article. Are there sort of common reactions or has anything sort of made you pause about other people's feedback around this? I think the reactions I got were really good. I was very happy. I got many emails with very thoughtful responses to the article. Mm. What struck me was how many people are like deeply unhappy with the way that they're raising their children in in weird societies, but also the feeling that there's no way out of... Mm -hmm. Like a lack of social support, is that sort of the main... Lack of social support, the idea that, of course, we also want our children to be responsive and responsible and aware of others. But in order to do that, then the steps that we need to take for our children to develop those qualities are not easy to implement in a system like the one we live in. There's no support. The idea of a baby spending a lot of time in the hands of other children is pretty taboo again. Mm. What what I felt from the comments I got was a frustration with the limits of the society we live in. And yes. I also didn't touch much on in the article, but Rona children also enjoy an incredible amount of freedom of movement and autonomy. So they learn to do many amazing things at a very early age. They're very physically fit. Uh, they're able to roam in groups completely unsupervised. So they also like not talking about needs they have, they are completely satisfied in terms of their physical needs, but also their, the autonomy and all that comes with being able to do things independently. Children are very proud of what they can do. They can fish, they can light a fire. When I was in Ecuador, I couldn't light a fire on my own. It was impossible. Mm. And I had four years old helping me to do that. And yeah, and it was just... Amazing to see that what we think that children are capable of actually really depends on how much we allow them to learn certain things. So maybe when we think about needs, we can also think about the things that are unfulfilled in our own society. And I think that lack of absence of free movement in space by children is an important one 
Um, yeah, it's huge. It's and I think a lot of the time video games fall into that as the place because if you're not allowed to run around outside because there's I don't know pedos and weirdos everywhere, then video games become the mm. sort of virtual space that you then are able to run around. And yeah, video games are fun, but it's it's not the same as the ability to yeah go and make your own fire or go. Yeah, go walk about, as it were. When I taught in a real poor slum neighborhood, the kids knew how to do the wash themselves, go to the laundromat, put in the quarters. They knew how to do a lot of the housework themselves, and they were in first grade. But they were also in a more predatory world because I'm old now. When I was young and lived in an apartment built with my family, in New York City, the drug drugs weren't yet introduced by the CIA to dismember neighborhoods. And people in my big apartment building often kept their doors open. And me and my sister would go around and say hello to everybody. The streets started getting dangerous. So my mother would have had to watch us. And so we moved to the suburbs. But there was also, there used to be a lot more independence of children and in the suburbs kids can go i was eight when we moved to a suburban kind of area and i could leave in the morning on a saturday I just had to be home for dinner i could yeah. do what i wanted yeah. but most american kids are urban and in danger and you do have to learn i mean i did have to learn about adult predators early when I went on the subway alone to my dance classes. Because America is a predatory place. The silver lining here really is what this also demonstrates. You have a line right at the end. There is more than one way to flourish as humans in this world. And it echoes that David Graeber quote. I think it's from the dawn of everything, or it might be from somewhere else, but it's just that same idea really, which is that yeah, as a species, we've made this world a particular way. We can just, we can remake it in a different image as well if we, if we want to. And I think what your article shows is that, yeah, there is very different ways of doing things. And with, by all accounts, it seems very positive outcomes. And so there is something about it that is maybe some kind of direction of travel for this frustration that people have come back in response to your ask with, that if there is a sort of a groundswell of frustration, then maybe that is the precursor to some kind of change. I really like the fact you mentioned David Graeber because he's certainly an influence on my work. I think that what the article wanted to be, okay, so the article didn't want to be a kind of preaching article telling weird parents that they're just failing in what they're doing. <laughs> there are so many of these and I really dislike that. I don't think that weird parents in weird societies need to hear that message because they are already feeling that on their own skin because they're bombarded with advice on how to improve your infant's brain in the first three years and all this kind of advice. So I, that's what I didn't want to do in the article. So I really wanted to offer hope and just and just suggest that maybe if we think about childbearing as inextricably linked to the society we live in and the kind of society we also want to live in, then maybe we can start making little changes in the direction oh. we would like this society and our children to go towards. Just another an anecdote that I would like to share from last year, last summer, Ecuador had national strikes, national indigenous strikes all over the country. The country was paralyzed for over a month and children were at the strike. Children were blockading roads with adults. And I think that the fact that children are not relegated to some child sphere, but rather are able to witness with their own eyes what goes on also at the political level, I think it's really important. And again, it can be a way to, to just to imagine a different way of being in the world. 
So if I can send one message would be that, yes, we can flourish very differently on this planet and we should be different and we should try to imagine different possibilities beginning from the work we do with our children. I remember reading a survey in the newspaper where they asked parents questions and 70% of the parents who responded said that they wished they hadn't had their children because it was anonymous. And so they could admit it's a big drag having children. You have all the financial responsibilities and the society doesn't help you. No, not that they phrased it that way. What one in 10 parents surveyed recorded that they hit their kids with objects. People get very frustrated in the United States and their children are in trouble. I think the vision of different childcare in preparation for a different and communal society is a great one. Yeah. The, the Dawn of Everything is a very interesting book and it does make parallel points, which is just that human societies have always done things in different ways and we always will, hopefully, there won't ever be a homogenous thing. And I think you, you identifying this kind of export parental ideology that's coming from the WHO and the World Bank and UNICEF is scary because it is a, a desire to have a homogenous way of bringing people up, but it's based on a whole bunch of assumptions embedded in capitalism. Also, the, what shocks me about the, this global ECD framework, so the intervention framework that has been deployed by UNICEF and yeah, the World Health Organization and the World Bank, it's the arrogance of just going to countries in the global south, thinking that we know exactly what they should be doing in order to get out of poverty, which anyways, it was the global north that created. So it's like the arrogance of just going around telling people because they tell parents, they have horrifying videos on their website about you should do this, you should play with your children, you should play with Lego with your children. You should be yeah, just talking to your children more because if they fail in school, it's because you haven't prepared them enough in their early years. And that's outrageous. Too. That's because yeah. the society doesn't want to take responsibility. It shifts it to the parents. And if you look at the history of the isolated nuclear family, it was formulated so the rich didn't have to pay taxes in order to support children. Okay they were the only ones with the money for universal child care. So they got out of it. And that's how it functions in the United States as well. Yeah. And so, and, and yet it's promulgated as a, an ideal for human development when it's not. It's just a tax dive excuse, a tax <laughs> dive. Yeah. Yeah, that's wild. Yeah. Okay. We're just about to hit the hour. We'll end it there. Thank you very much for your time and for your work. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Harriet. And... Yes, I hope we'll speak again. Massive thank you as always to our VIP patrons, Rebecca Johns, Bruce Rogers Vaughan, Alexander Lashley, Sheena Belmas, Seamus O'Connell, Alex Placito, Alexandra McCormick, Wig Shaker, Elizabeth McKechnie, Fontaine, Hartley Wilmoth, Red Yen Cola, Joseph Carreri, E, and Sean Venado. By the way, listeners, if you have enjoyed anything you've heard Harriet say in this program, you will definitely enjoy Capitalism Hits Home, which is a solo program that Harriet does through Democracy at Work, which is a worker-owned cooperative that produces other great programs such as Economic Update with Richard Wolff and the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles with David Harvey. I can't recommend enough that everyone also listen to Capitalism Hits Home if you enjoy It's Not Just in Your Head. And if you want to hear even more from Harriet, check out her radio show, Inter personal update on WBAI and in the WBAI archives.